Now moving on to pregnancy assessment. In this video, we're going to cover the signs of pregnancy, including these three categories. Number one are presumptive signs, and this means that you might be pregnant. Number two are probable signs. This means that you are probably pregnant. The last one is positive signs. You are definitely pregnant, faux show. We will also cover Nagel's rule and show you how to calculate an expected due date of the baby. So be sure to stick around. Starting with presumptive signs of pregnancy. These are known as subjective or self-reported signs. They are unconfirmed signs where the client thinks they are pregnant, often with subjective data, where they kind of just feel like they're pregnant. First off, we have amenorrhea, so no period. Next is nausea and vomiting. This can be from stress like studying for the NCLEX and does not mean you are pregnant. Quickening or movement in the belly from a possible baby. But then again, this is self-reported and may often be false since it's not felt by a provider. It may also be a stomach gurgling from say, a bad burrito. So this is definitely a presumptive sign. Next, we have urinary frequency. And this is very common in the first trimester, those first 12 weeks and is due to hormonal and anatomical changes. And lastly, breast tenderness and fatigue. Now, ATI mentioned presumptive signs of pregnancy. Which of the following findings should the nurse expect the client to report? Select all that apply. So the three answers here would be amenorrhea, nausea and vomiting, and quickening. Now, Hesse mentioned symptoms of pregnancy, and this would be that urinary frequency. Now moving on to probable signs. These are also called objective signs of pregnancy and they are observed by the provider, which may still have alternate reasons other than actual pregnancy. Now for some key terms that love to show up on tests. First, we have Goodell sign. This is cervical softening. A soft cervix is a good sign. So the memory trick here is Goodell is a good sign. In true pregnancy, this sign occurs approximately at four weeks gestation, but may also be caused by other conditions that result in pelvic congestion, like the use of hormonal contraceptives and even uterine tumors. The next key term is Chadwick sign. This is that blue or purple discoloration of the birth canal. A memory trick for you is that Chad is a bully and he'll beat you black and blue. In true pregnancy, the dark bluish or purplish discoloration is caused by increased blood flow to the area. Lastly, we have Hagar sign. This is the softening of the lower uterine segment. The memory trick is the double H's here. So H for Hagar is like a soft pillow uterus where the H head goes. Hey there, nursing student, listen up. Did you know only 20% of our videos are here on YouTube? You're missing out on over 900 videos not on YouTube, plus 500 visual study guides that follow along every video, and a massive quiz bank to test your knowledge. All neatly organized in our new app. Try it for free. Visit simplenursing.com today. And this is due to its increased blood supply. Now, ATI mentions a bluish discoloration of the cervix, and it's observed as early as eight to 10 weeks, this is known as Chadwick sign. So yes, Chad is that bully and he makes you black and blue. A few other objective signs of pregnancy include ballotment, which we call fetus against the finger. This is that sharp upward pushing against the uterine wall with the finger inserted into the vagina. And it's diagnosed by feeling the return impact of the displaced fetus. And lastly, a positive pregnancy HCG test. This test reports elevated levels of HCG, but gestational trophoblastic disease can also cause a positive result. So the best time for the urine sample is in the morning, right when the client gets out of bed. Now ATI mentions a home pregnancy test. You want to perform the test the first time you urinate in the morning. Lastly, we have positive signs, and these are known as diagnostic signs of pregnancy that provide absolute proof with conclusive evidence. Now, these signs include a fetal heartbeat that is heard by a Doppler device at the 10 to 12 week mark, and it's also heard throughout pregnancy, which is a huge NCLEX tip, so be sure to write that down. Secondly, an ultrasound visualization of the fetus is another NCLEX tip. And lastly, fetal movement that is palpated or observed by the HCP, that healthcare provider, is another positive sign. 
So be sure to write these three down as absolute proof of pregnancy, AKA positive signs of pregnancy. Okay, so Kaplan mentioned a client is certain of pregnancy and reports feeling the baby move. So which response by the nurse is best? So this would be to lie down so that I can listen for the fetal heart tones with the Doppler. Thanks, Nurse Barbara. Right now we're gonna be talking about the EDB, expected date of birth, also referred to as the EDD, expected due date. Now determining this is vitally important because planning and interventions during pregnancy are based on this information. For example, does labor need to be induced and diagnosing preterm labor, just to name a few. Now common methods of determining EDB is an ultrasound as the gold standard. But the top tested method to know for exams is Nagel's rule. So Nagel's rule is where we look at the first day of the last menstrual period based on the 28 day menstrual cycle. And we minus three months and then add seven days and that equals the EDB, the estimated date of birth. Now I know that sounds really confusing, but let's do a few examples here. So example question one, the first day of the last menstrual period is April 1st. Subtract three months, that's January 1st, and then add seven days. So January 8th is the expected date of birth. Now example two, the first day of the last menstrual period is October 1st. Subtract three months, that's around July 1st. And then add seven days, so that's July 8th. So the correct answer is July 8th. And example three, the first day of the last menstrual period is June 25th. So we subtract three months, that's March 25th, and then add seven days, that's April 1st. So the expected date of birth is April 1st. The baby will be born on April Fool's. Oops. Now don't let the NCLEX fool you. With Nagel's rule, it is based on the first day of the last menstrual period, not the last day, as menses can vary in length from person to person. And also, it's not on the expected date of ovulation or even vaginal spotting. So remember, don't let the NCLEX trick you here. It's on the first day of the last menstrual period. Now be sure to write out this formula at least 10 times per day the week of your exam. Trust me, the NCLEX and exit exams love to ask these questions. So once again, it's the first day of the last menstrual period minus three months and then add seven days. That equals the estimated date of birth. So ATI had three questions on this, but here's the most tricky question we found. A client presents reporting that her last menstrual period began on January 1st and ending on January 5th. She notes that she had unprotected intercourse on January 15th and has some spotting on January 22nd. According to Nagel's rule, which of the following is the estimated date of delivery? So see how ATI has a really tricky question here? But focus on the key word here. Last menstrual period began on January 1st. So we use January 1st, subtract three months, that's October 1st, and then add seven days. So the correct answer is October 8th. Hey there, did you like the video so far? Well, to watch the other half, not here on YouTube, visit us at Simple Nursing. You'll also get exclusive access to full courses and hundreds of more videos not here on YouTube. Plus, our beautiful study guides that follow along each video. And our NCLEX style practice questions that help you to reinforce your knowledge. Join for free. Simply click right here. I'll see you there. And Hesse also had three questions, but here's one of them. A client states her last menstrual period began on February 15th and that previously her periods were regular 28 day cycles. What is this client's expected date of birth? So February 15th minus three months is November 15th and then add seven days. So the correct answer here is November 22nd. Okay, now finally for a top missed NCLEX question that incorporates a little bit of everything that we learned thus far. A client presents to the hospital stating that she tested positive on a home pregnancy test. The client's last menstrual period was on August 7th, and today is November 7th. Which of the following options are correct for this client? Select all that apply. 
Okay, so it looks like this client has been pregnant for about 12 weeks now, the first trimester. So the expected date of delivery is May 14th. According to Nagel's rule, August 7th minus three months is May 7th, and then add seven days. So that's May 14th. Now the next option here is auscultation of fetal heartbeat via Doppler is possible. So yes, this is correct as a fetal heart rate can be heard via Doppler or ultrasound. And very lastly, urinary frequency is very common in the first trimester. Now very lastly, assessments during pregnancy. A big key term to know is uterine growth and fundal height. Remember, uterine growth is assessed by fundal height. As you know, the uterus is the womb, which I call the baby apartment, since this is where the baby grows and develops. And the fundus is the top portion of the uterus. We can call that the ceiling to the baby apartment. Now it's important to use a measuring tape to measure the fundal height in centimeters, specifically in the second and third trimester. And always have the client empty their bladder first, or the measurement may be off. So the locations of uterine fundus. Starting at 12 weeks, it is above the symphysis pubis, which is a big NCLEX tip. And then it begins to rise. So by 16 weeks, it's halfway between the symphysis pubis and the umbilicus. And then it rises further at 20 weeks on the umbilicus. So the memory trick that's often used. For fundal height in centimeters, this should equal the weeks of gestation plus or minus about two weeks. For example, 30 weeks pregnant will have a fundal height close to 30 centimeters. So ATI mentions 24 weeks gestation, most likely fundal height, 26 centimeters. Yes, plus or minus two weeks for two centimeters. And lastly, 36 weeks is right around the xiphoid process. And 38 to 40 weeks, the fetus engages into the maternal pelvis and the fundal height drops. Moving on to the GPT-PAL assessment. Now for your exams and boards, you will need to know how to evaluate pregnant clients and calculate the GPT-PAL. Now these questions love to show up on exit exams and on your NCLEX, so be sure to pay close attention and take notes. Now G is for gravidity or gravita, and this is the number of pregnancies the client has had, including abortions, miscarriages, and the current pregnancy. Now keep in mind that twins or triplets count as one pregnancy. Now, a few other key terms to know for gravita include nulli gravita. This is where the client has never been pregnant, and so the number is zero. Now, premi gravita is the first pregnancy, and multi gravita, the patient has been pregnant more than once. Moving on to P for para. This is the number of deliveries after 20 weeks gestation. Now, sometimes this P is not included. An example here is a patient who is a G4 P3. This means that she's been pregnant four times in total, including the current pregnancy, and she's delivered three babies. T is for term births. This is the number of births over 37 weeks and delivered. The next P is for preterm births. This is the number of births between 20 and 37 weeks, whether alive or stillborn. And again, twins and triplets only count as one. Next, we have A for abortion or miscarriage. This is the number of times a woman has lost a pregnancy for whatever reason. If a baby dies before 20 weeks, it is considered an A, so an abortion. And then if the baby dies after 20 weeks, it is added under the P for preterm and not here under abortion. Lastly, we have L for living children. This refers to live births and not necessarily the current living children. Again, twins and triplets count as one. So be sure to pause the screen and write down the keywords here and know them for your exams. Now, I know that was a lot to remember, but the exit exams and the NCLEX expect you to know these terms. So let's do some practice questions from the major NCLEX review question banks. First up, we have an ATI question. A nurse reads the following data, G2, T1, P0, A1, and L1. Based on this information, what does the nurse know is true about the client? Select all that apply. Okay, so before looking at all of the options, let's look at the key terms and break this down. So the G is two, meaning that the client has had two pregnancies. T is one, so there's been one full term birth over 37 weeks. P is zero, meaning no preterm births before 37 weeks. A is one, 
only one abortion or miscarriage before 20 weeks. And lastly, the L is one, meaning there is one living child. So reviewing over the answer options, the client has delivered one newborn at term. Yes, this is correct because T was one. Next, the client has had no preterm deliveries, and this is correct because P is zero. The client has had two prior pregnancies. Yes, this is correct because G is two. Lastly, the client has one living child, and again, yes, we can see that the L is one. So Kaplan mentions, a client is pregnant for the third time. The client has one living child and has had one abortion. Which description does the nurse record? Okay, so before looking at all of the options, let's look at these key terms and break it down. G is for gravidity, so the client has been pregnant three times. One living child, so L is one, and one abortion, so A is also one. So we have G3, L1, and A1. And lastly, we have a top missed NCLEX question. A client is being seen in the pregnancy clinic for a new pregnancy. Last year, she had a spontaneous abortion at three months gestation. What will the nurse document in the client's chart regarding her GPT pal? Okay, so before looking at the options again, let's break it down and look at the key terms. So now this is her second pregnancy, so G has to be two. T is for term, which is zero, since there haven't been any pregnancies that have gone to a full term. Now P for preterm is zero, since that spontaneous abortion occurred at three months, so 12 weeks gestation, which is before that 20 to 37 week mark, which leaves A abortion is one, and zero live births thus far. So the correct answer here is G2, T0, P0, A1, and L0. All right, that wraps it up. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take your quiz and download the study guides. And also feel free to share the love, share with a classmate and even your instructor. See you guys in the next videos.